So from Wednesday night, uh, you know, obviously we finished up John chapter 7. And uh, John chapter 7, just those last verses there, you'll remember. The, the Pharisees, uh, they sent, uh, you know, several of their officers to seize Christ. But they did not seize Christ. When they came back empty-handed, uh, the Pharisees, they kind of had this idea about him. And they asked why. And they said, because no one has ever spoken like this man before. Uh, which, go, which goes into um, the way that he had taught in, in the synagogues uh, from the time that he was a youth. So no one has spoken like this man before, and then they started arguing among themselves, and really the Pharisees basically said that they were the only ones who understood the law. And everybody, it says there in uh, the last verse, uh, verse 53 of chapter 7, everyone went to his home. So uh, I tell you what, instead of reading the, the whole chapter, um, because of the way this particular chapter is broken down, we'll just read, read it in sections and then go back and, and look at those various sections. So the first section, I'll go ahead and read. It's of the, uh, the quote-unquote adulterous woman found in verses 1 through 11. It says, so just finishing up chapter 7, it says, Everyone went to his home, but Jesus, verse 1, went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they say to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, now the, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman, where she was, in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go. From now, on, from now on, sin no more. So uh, we have that, uh, you know, this feast uh, over in Jerusalem. Uh, this feast in Jerusalem, people have left. Some have gone to their own home. And it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Mount of Olives, that's about an hour walk from the middle of Jerusalem. And in the gospel, according to Mark, after the Last Supper, it says Jesus and his disciples, they came to a place called Gethsemane. And he said, uh, sit here while I pray. And we remember them falling asleep, not being able to stay awake. That's in Mark 14, 32. Well, at the same time, in Matthew, uh, it says in chapter 26... Matthew chapter 26 and verse 30. Let's get over here. It says, uh, uh, again, after this Last Supper, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So which is it? Did they go to the Mount of Olives or the Garden of Gethsemane, or is it the same place, right? Uh, it's important as far as the geography is concerned. Well, the Mount of Olives is actually a, a part of a mountain range uh, that separates Jerusalem from the Judean desert, okay? So if you, you think of this mountain range, uh, I don't know what the elevation is offhand, but um, this particular mountain is really the, the central peak, and, and it resembles a, a large rocky hill uh, that's, that's out there. But it was once, at one time, a place where there were many olive trees. And the Mount of Olives, uh, it's part of that mountain range. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane uh, is a garden that sits at the base of the Mount of Olives. 
So you're coming out of Jerusalem, and you have, and about an hour's walk from Jerusalem, from the heart of Jerusalem, you have this mountain range, and you've got the Mount of Olives. That's kind of the main peak, and then at the base of the mountain, you have this this Garden of Geth, Gethsemane there. And the name literally means oil press, and it's also another reference, obviously, to the the olive trees that are in the area. And I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of Gethsemane or not, and the olive trees that are there, but some of them are thicker than redwood trees. I'm, I mean, we're talking huge uh, as, you know, how far uh, their diameter is concerned. So uh, to, answer, to answer the question, after the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples, they went to the Mount of Olives, more specifically to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I point that out only because, um, one, just an interesting note uh, as far as the geography, but also it's important when you come to the crucifixion of Christ or his arrest, uh, you think uh, of Jerusalem and you've got this mountain range, but they're down there in the garden. So when they're coming to arrest him, all of the, the guards and what have you, it's nighttime, so they've got torches and lamps and all of this. He could see all of them coming uh, down the hill and still didn't leave. So, again, uh, Mount of Olives, uh, so it's just saying that he went to that mount, not specifically uh, to the garden at, at this point. So then, of course, uh, and then early in the morning, uh, he, came, he came again to the temple, all the people coming there with him. Now, Think about that. It's an hour walk. It was late in the evening when they left. So he walks for an hour and gets there. And then it says in the morning he came back into the temple. So he's got his hour-long walk back. And he begins to teach. Now, just kind of skipping there to, to verse 5, the law of Moses commanded us to stone, stone such a woman. So what do you say? Now, their treatment of the woman, and it really is callous and, and pretty demanding, it just in the sense of adultery and no sense of compassion or, or empathy or, or forgiveness and what have you. And if she had committed adultery the previous evening, which would have been more likely than in the morning or early in the day when everybody is up. You know, the Old Testament in Psalms and Proverbs both, it speaks about people who sin that it's primarily done at night uh, and under the cover of darkness where, where no one can see. So if someone was going to commit adultery, it makes more sense that it would have been at night when people were in their homes, off of the streets, you know, not in the morning when there's the hustle and bustle of the, the city going on. So we can assume, but we can assume, though, that they, uh, that her, these opponents of Christ, that they had been holding her during the night. Uh, that maybe they had arrested her at night or taken her at night for the sin of adultery, kept her captive, waiting for Christ to, to show up in the morning. Did they know he was going to show up? No idea. Right? Um, but uh, to use her to test him, her and, you know, her fear, it's going to be great. You know, putting her in the midst of this crowd, that, that adds, to, of course, to the public humiliation. And there's a certain attitude, we have to admit, of male chauvinism that comes across in their statement that the law of Moses commands the stoning, it says there, of such women, such a woman as this, Right? More precisely, the law speaks of death of both the man and the woman. If we turn back to uh, Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20 is where we find this law. And verse 10, if there's a man who gets, commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. 
Now, uh, also, if we go over to Deuteronomy chapter 22, and we can start in uh, verse 22 and reading down uh, through, let's see here, uh, verse 29 of Deuteronomy 22, because some people will ask, okay, well, what if it's not adultery? What if it's something like rape? Well, what about that, right? So also in the law, that it includes that. So Deuteronomy 22, reading from verse 22 down to verse 29, if a, man is, if a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a girl who is a virgin engaged to a man and another man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring both out to the gate of, the, of that city and you shall stone them to death. The girl, because she did not cry out in the city, and the man, because he has violated his neighbor's wife, thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Now, the idea, well, let's just read it here. But if in the field the man finds the girl who is engaged, and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lies with her shall die. But you shall do nothing to the girl. There is no sin in the girl worthy of death. For just as a man rises against his neighbor and murders him, so is this case. When he found her in the field, the engaged girl cried out, but there was no one to save her. If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not engaged, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are discovered, then the man who lay with her shall give to the girl's father 50 shekels of silver, and she shall become his wife because he has not violated her. He cannot divorce her all of his days. Okay. So, you know, it, it's interesting there. Now, you think about the girl in the city and, and that idea that she is also to be stoned, and it says because she did not cry out. The implication there is if there is this forceful act, then she is going to cry out and someone is going to hear. So it's the idea, the, the lying with someone and versus the taking by force, lie, the lying with someone being consensual, the taking by force, uh, obviously not. So, but the law requires, and again, these are people who they love to quote the law, but they don't actually follow all of it, is that the law of Moses tells us that we are supposed to stone such women as this. Well, the law also says that you're supposed to stone the man as well. So some scholars uh, tend to believe that she may not have actually been committing adultery. That it may just be that they found, uh, found some woman, you know, took her kind of captive until the morning and made the accusation against her. And they may, th and some scholars tend to think that that's the reason why uh, Christ did not mention the condemnation. That's why he didn't mention, you know, and say, well, where's the man according to the law of Moses? Because every time they tried to use the law with Christ, he always, well, he always kind of threw it back in their face, right? So there is that thought. But so, you know, they do have this somewhat commendable zeal for righteousness, but it's a shallow righteousness because there's really no concern for the soul of this woman. It's all about the law. Again, no sympathy, no empathy, no compassion. It's all about this, not what about her soul, right? Um, they're also being pretty deceitful. Again, there's, there's actually no... Uh, evidence uh, when you look at the words of Epictetus or Josephus or any of those early historians there's actually not a lot of evidence that this was carried out on a regular basis so the um, so that so they raise this question in the name of loyalty to Moses just as they had said before you know we have Abraham as our father we've got Moses and and, and all of this so using a part of Moses' teaching that they themselves more than likely didn't keep, you know, um, based on historical records, they were not the, they were not the purest of people, <laughs> you know. Uh, they, they had issues as well. 
And since the law says both the man and the woman who commit adultery to, to be killed, uh, you know, we are left wondering why the man was not brought in uh, as well. Again, that's why some scholars think that there may not have actually been an act of adultery here. Um, because if someone did, let's, let's just say, for example, uh, that this woman was seized in the middle of adultery and someone sees someone sees this arrest you're generally not going to send just one guard or, or one person to arrest someone mainly because the law two or three witnesses there right so there's going to be at least two or three people that would typically go to arrest someone so it's a little bit of a group and then you're seeing them drag this woman you know, uh, depending on what time of the day it was. Again, we might think it was the night before. But someone would have seen something and, and maybe thought, you know, to ask a question, uh, you know, where's the man, if it was the case of adultery, whatever the case may be. But there's a lot of speculation surrounding this. And, um, and it's also possible that the guy escaped, you know. It's very possible that he went out the window when they came in the door. Who knows? But uh, the fact that only the woman was brought, it kind of raises suspicions, and it really doesn't speak well of their zeal. Because if you remember in chapter 7, uh, when we looked at the Old Testament law, they were supposed to investigate things as far as they possibly could. So if this woman was truly committing adultery, then, and let's say the man escaped, then they would have, uh, you know, investigated to find out who this man was in order to properly keep the law and bring him to be stoned as well. Uh, again, the law makes it clear um, when we read of uh, uh, Nicodemus there in uh, verse 51 of John chapter 7, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing. Uh, remember, uh, we talked about that on, on Wednesday. So the, their hypocrisy, it, it's evident. And they were saying that to, to test him. Uh, it's apparently just, uh, just an attempt to entrap Christ, as they always did. If he's lax towards the law, then he's condemned, especially by their standard. Because remember the previous chapter, they said the crowd was, anybody remember? Uh, accursed, uh, that they were ignorant of the law. And then they uh, said that when their officers came back, having not seized Christ, they were saying the same thing about them. So only they were the ones in their own minds who were able to fully interpret the law. So if Christ, uh, when, you know, if he's lax toward the law, then they can condemn him because he doesn't hold to the same standard that they do. But if he holds to the strict line uh, of the law, then he's allowed them and condoned their treatment of this woman, uh, their ungodly treatment of her in not following the, the law themselves. And he opens him out, himself up to, to trouble with the Romans because he's going to be held responsible if the stoning proceeds, not them. They didn't, they didn't actually stone anybody. They bring her out, and they're asking, really, for permission. You give us permission to stone her, you know? And they stone her, the Romans are going to look to him. And what do we know so far about his time? Yeah, his time had not yet come. So, uh, any any thoughts or, or comments so far? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting, you know, well, well, we'll get there in a second. 
So they keep on asking him this. Uh, and verse 7, you know, he who's without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So what is she being accused of again? Adultery. So again, some scholars believe that what he's saying there is not talking necessarily about having no sin in your life. But does anybody remember the discussion that we had regarding judgment and righteous judgment and what have you and not judging based off of appearance and, and all of that? And, you know, the judging your brother for the speck that's in his eye when you've got the log in your own eye and how it's the same sin and, you know, I couldn't necessarily judge someone of, uh, you know, this crime. If I'm committing that same crime, I need to kind of get that right first. Some people tend to think when he's saying without, uh, you know, let he who is uh, without sin among you cast the first stone and she is being accused of adultery, that he is actually using the, the same theme in the sense that, hey, whichever one of you is not committing adultery, go ahead and stone her. Does that make sense? And yet, not a single person does. So, so that's just kind of an interesting thought. Now, how accurate is that? We don't know. But one of the things uh, of, of study is, of course, to open it up to see, well, maybe it is talking about this. Maybe this sin, you know, because there's no one except Christ without sin. And you think about it, if there is, you know, Romans 3.23, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every person has sinned. And so if Jesus is saying, okay, if you, have a, if you don't have sin... Then, then you can judge someone. Then you can carry out the law against them. Well, we know that would be kind of a contradiction, wouldn't it? Because he tells us to judge, for example, and judge with righteous judgment. There are certain things that we are told to do. But if we can't do them unless we are sinless, then we can't do them at all. And so Christ really kind of contradicts himself. So that, that's part of what leads to the idea of carrying through with the theme in that really he's not saying, if you don't have any sin in your life, sure, go ahead and stone her. That the idea may be that, yeah, whichever one of you ha hasn't committed ad adultery and hasn't got, you know, you haven't got caught or whatever, if you haven't done it, then sure, go ahead and stone her. But no one does. Just, just kind of a thought there. Any, any thoughts uh, about that, though? Or comments. I've never heard it put that way. I mean, if he says you could have never sinned, I always thought it was any sin. Yeah, right. No, it, it is kind of a, it is kind of a, I've always found it a, an interesting thought. Because on the one hand, like I said, and maybe I can clear it up a, a little bit more if I didn't when I first said it. So we're to judge, not by appearance, but with righteous judgment. And in our judgment, we are determining, based on the word of God, that righteous judgment, what is sinful, what is not, right? The Bible tells us that certain things are sins. But if I can't judge that unless I'm without sin and everybody sins, then really I can't judge anything at all. And if I can't judge what's right and wrong, even based off of the word of God, because I'm not sinless, then is there a point to any of it? Is there a point to sit there and, you know, preach that this is wrong or this is right or, or telling people this is wrong or this is right? I've got no business doing that because I have sinned. Sure, that's what the law of Moses told them to do. So they were ready to go ahead and punish. I think they all understood that it's wrong, you know, just as Jesus told them, leave your life of sin. But uh, there's a difference, I think, between judging that something is wrong and then you get ready to punish that person, taking punishment and do your own you know, responsibility. 
Sure, I, I, I agree with that. I agree that there is definitely a, a difference between judgment and actual carrying out the sentence, but based on the Old Testament law, Moses told them that's what they were supposed to do. So they had every right to carry it out. Now, granted, they wouldn't have done it in, within the city walls. They would have taken the person outside the city as they did with Stephen. We, I, well, yeah, kind of. Um, I, I, you know, just having just a parallel Bible, you know, makes me wonder if, um, if this being after his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had already told a great multitude that, you know, if you look at a woman lustfully, you commit an adultery in your heart. Right. And then you saying what you said about this might have had them thinking about that one, too. Yeah. No, absolutely right. So it might not have even been, you know, physical adultery. You know, could have been that. You know, Jesus always took things to the next level. You know, you have hatred in your heart. He equates that with murder, lust. He equates with adultery, as Barry said. So there, there's a lot in there. Uh, any other thoughts or comments, though? Okay. So... Uh, this kind of third stage to Jesus' response to the, to the opponents in verses 6 through 9, it, it really is memorable. So while he's seated, he bends over and, and he writes with his finger on the ground. Now, the act of writing uh, on the ground is significant in and of itself um, because uh, it was unlawful. We've got to remember the day that it was. This is a Sabbath, right? And it's unlawful to write even two letters on the Sabbath. But that writing with dust was permissible. Uh, you, you, may not remember, you may remember this, uh, may not, but how certain things were allowed to be done on the Sabbath. For example, uh, you know, we talked about spit uh, on the ground and how you could move it with your foot and that wasn't lawful on the Sabbath. And I don't know who would do that anyways. That's pretty disgusting. Uh, but just all of those kind of little laws that, that they had in there. So you couldn't write anything down, but you could write, write in the dust. But so if, it were the, if, this, if this were the eighth day of the feast, which was to be kept as a day of rest, then Jesus writing on the ground would show that he not only knows the law, but also the oral interpretations of the law. Because remember, we had the written law, right? But then we also had the oral traditions and the oral interpretations of the law. So if Christ had, you know, just, if he had started writing, I don't know, borrow a pen and paper from somebody, then obviously that's a problem. But him writing down is, I not only know the law, but I know how you interpret the law as well. And I am, and I am even following that. And his writing actually echoes an Old Testament passage, uh, turning it into a kind of a symbolic action. Um, see here, uh, Jeremiah 17 and verse 13. Jeremiah 17 and verse 13, it says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all for, who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. So here the written in the dust, it probably means the opposite of being written in the book of life, right? We take of uh, Psalm 1 and, and uh, those six verses there, how the wicked, they're like the chaff that the wind drives away and, and whatnot. Uh, those who have turned away are, are consigned to death because they've rejected Christ, who is the what of life. Okay, there's a bread of life. But in context with Jeremiah, so he's, he's the water of life. He, he's that wellspring, Jeremiah talking about a, uh, a spring there, the source of the water of life. So it appears that Jesus, he's associating his opponents with those who God condemns. Uh, for this, for forsaking himself, and he consigns to death. So the judgment that they suggest here, 
Jesus execute on this, I, and I say quote unquote adulterous woman because there is no evidence that she actually committed adultery, right? We just refer to that. So the judgment that they suggest Christ execute on, on this woman is the fact that, uh, is in the fact that he, the judgment he visits on their rejection of him, the one who is offered this living water as we read in chapter 30, or chapter 7, not, not 37, but chapter 7 and verses 38 and 39, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Uh, but this he spoke of the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet uh, glorified. So, and all of this is conveyed really in Jesus' simple action of riding on the ground. Are they going to know that? Not necessarily. They could have. Because we have no idea what he wrote on the ground, you know. For all we know, he wrote Jeremiah, you know, or something. <laughs> right? We have no idea. So it is possible that they knew what he was referencing. They may not have. Not a clue. So they hear it. They begin to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, verse 9, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. So Jesus calls for the one without sin to cast the first stone, he actually accomplishes a, a few things here. First of all, it relieves him from the charge of having instigated the stoning. Because remember, they did this in order to entrap him. They're, you know, within the city walls, because remember, he was at the Mount of Olives. He comes, you know, he walks that hour back. He's in the temple. They bring the woman in the center of the court. Stoning, if it was to take place, would have been outside the city walls, right? And so if they ask him, they try to instigate, get him to, to execute judgment in stoning this woman, they do that at his bidding. And next thing you know, the Romans, they're coming in. There's a problem. Can't let that happen because his time had not yet come. So by saying, so by first saying, you know, you who are without sin cast the first stone, so he, he deflects it from him to them, All right? So, so that's the first thing that he does. It, it, it ensures, one, that there's not going to be a stoning since none of the accusers will, are going to want to take responsibility for it because, again, the Romans in city walls, in the temple, in the court. And it also calls on them maybe, hopefully, to reflect on their own sinfulness before God. I mean, granted, for all we know, they just, they left and, you know, just started talking about Jesus behind his back, you know, around the, the water cooler at the temple and everything. I would like to think that there would have at least been one person who had a moment of clarity and self-reflection to, to just sit there, what am I doing? Why, why was I willing to stone that woman? You know, I, I would hope that there would at least be one person that, that does that. And that should be the case with all of us, really. You know, we see something that's not in line with God, and we should, and maybe we don't catch ourselves until after the fact, but then to may, maybe reflecting, what was I doing? Would God have been pleased with the way that I, I acted, I don't know, in this meeting or at lunch today with, you know, the people from the congregation or whatever the case may be, you know? Just that moment of that. So that, that's hopefully the second thing that, that happens. Now, and of course the text, it, it suggests that it was the eldest, the older uh, accusers, they were leaving first because maybe their maturity, they recognized their own sinfulness easier. They didn't have the ego of, of the younger people in the crowd. Older people all, all know what that feels like, right? It's like, okay, okay, you're going to learn. You're, you're going to see your own mistakes. I've already been there done that, you know. Um, but leaving it in the order, it may also, it, it could also re 
just reflect the custom of the time, of the younger def deferring to the older, you know, just kind of watching them, what, what are they going to do, and, and I'll kind of follow their, their lead. So, uh, and those, it's interesting, because we might not think about it, but those who leave, the older ones and then the younger ones, they condemn themselves as they had throughout their entire time, uh, their, all of their encounters with Christ. They condemn themselves by not casting a stone, right? If you're without sin, you go ahead and cast a stone. Well, no one casts a stone, so apparently you've got sin. And speculation, maybe this. Um, but no, absolutely. So Jesus, hey, we don't have a bell in here, I just remembered. No, I'm not talking about what you call Gary, but... <laughs> So straightening up, Jesus said to her, verse 10, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? So Jesus, he's left alone. He's sitting on the ground. He's bent over. He's, he's riding. I've got two minutes. <laughs> um, the, two are, uh, the two were left alone. And if this woman was, in fact... Um, you know, guilty of adultery, and just the picture there that the idea of a sinful person, there, there's no one else around. And it's just this, we'll say for the sake of argument, this sinful woman, because Jesus did say, go and sin no more. That there's no one else around, and it's the sinful woman and mercy. That's ultimately what it comes down to for every single one of us, right? When it is, I mean, I know that we have, you know, family and friends and church family and all of this, but ultimately what it comes down to is us as a sinful individual and God's mercy. That's it. It doesn't matter what everybody else is accusing us of doesn't matter what everybody else is saying about us or, or what they're willing to do uh, about us because their sins are their sins. God's going to deal with them. Ultimately, it comes down to us and God's mercy. And we could sit there and make the thought uh, or, or connect the thought of her kneeling on the ground while he is there standing up in kneeling, you know, begging for forgiveness, begging for pardon, begging for mercy. And there, mercy stands right at her feet, ready to offer it, all right? Um, real quick. So he straightens up. He asks her, you know, kind of the report of what happened, you know, where are, where are your accusers? Uh, did no one condemn you? Um, she seems totally oblivious to what took place. Um, maybe afraid of what he said. I, I'm not sure. But he doesn't, he doesn't ask her about the charges. He doesn't ask her if it's true or not. Now, we know that, that Jesus knew, but he doesn't ask her about whether they're true. He doesn't ask her about anything like that. He, he, they had condemned her in their accusations, but by not following through on the charge, they had actually thrown out her case. Because if she were in fact guilty, and if they were willing to take responsibility for it, if they were willing to practice what they preached, then it wouldn't have mattered with the Romans. They would have drug her outside the court. This was all to entrap Christ. But there's no one left who could still execute the judgment. The only one present was the one who was without sin. Jesus could throw this first stone. So you have to think, at this point, is she hopeful or is she frightened? See, Jesus hasn't pardoned her yet. He hasn't said, go and sin no more yet. He hasn't said, I don't condemn you yet. She's been brought out before this crowd in the middle of the court, the, thinking she's going to get stoned. All of these people leave. It's just her and Christ. 
You have to wonder, one, did she know who he was? If not, was she actually hopeful that she would be allowed to leave? Or was she scared because he said, let no one who's, with, you know, if you've got sin, or if you don't have sin, throw the first stone, and he's the only one standing. Is she hopeful or is she scared that he's going to pick up a rock? That points to another part of us about judgment. We've got sin in our lives. We kneel, and, uh, we kneel there at mercy. And we have to wonder sometimes. What, what will Jesus say to us? What will he do to us? Will we be condemned and punished? Or will we be granted mercy? And so we kind of sit on that, that precipice as well. Any closing thoughts or comments? Could be. Any? <laughs> Maybe. Could be. Any other thoughts or comments? Appreciate it. So we'll pick up verse 11 on Wednesday. Hey, look at that. Ten verses. Who would have thunk it? You know?